mortality no longer feels like some abstraction that I could push away to the age of 80 or 90 or you know, there's no longer a luxury of, of pushing mort the idea of mortality away. And what's difficult is um, living in a society that's never been able to deal with death unless they own it in the form of weaponry or control or uh, assassination or murder. And most people I know um, seem to not be able to help but continually abstract notions of death. And, or most people I know can never even speak the words death. And given that um, the effects of this disease hasn't really begun to show itself externally for me, uh, I find that if I run into people that I know and they ask me how I feel and if I feel really terrible and I tell them that, um, the common response is, oh, but you look great. Uh, almost as if that means, well, I have, I'm not going to disappear, I'm not going to die immediately, so therefore they can avoid the whole notion of illness and death uh, or abstract it to a later point. Um, most of the people that I've known or been friendly with over the years I don't bother to associate with anymore because of this, of what I feel uh, is their response to this epidemic or to the response, uh, their res lack of response to the idea of mortality itself, the fact that they can't deal with it, uh, have the luxury to not deal with it for the moment. Um, and I, I just find it too odd or frustrating to to care to experience the reflection of my slow illness and death in their eyes or in their lack of uh, response. And I have a, a, a friend who died about a month and a half ago from AIDS and towards the end of his life he would sit at my table and just say, I hate healthy people. I just hate healthy people. And, and it, you know, I, I really understood it wasn't a shocking statement. It's a, it's people with some relative degree of health, not all people, but most people just tend to abstract mortality, thinking that somehow it's something they'll, they'll have to deal with when they're, you know, in their 70s or 80s. And here we are in our 20s and 30s and 40s, of, you know, dealing with with this loss and dealing with this sense of mortality around us and inside of us. So to, to be at a, a relatively young age and be witnessing so much death and to be experiencing so much death, um, you know, sets off, uh, uh, I guess, emotions that would lead somebody to say that they hate healthy people. I'm still trying to acclimate myself to the idea of my own death um, but it's like it's more that my sense of what life is uh, has slowly been emptying out so that things like reason are really difficult things to arrive at at this point. I find that ideas of reason, reason for living, reason for making things, reason for communication are slowly becoming like a void or one big blank and uh, you know something of just emptiness it's like seeing the functionings of the world you know through the window or walking down the street occasionally and s those functions or those movements of other people and other uh, you know of the, the the little particulars of the structure of the society just lose again meaning or reason or they become less and less meaningful or they it's it's something about stopping um, or no longer being able to create and sustain a direction for myself or or some abstract point in in what we call future uh, to move towards things just touch me less and less and uh, all the, all the semblances of living that people do or create or enact somehow become more and more empty. I mean, I would prefer 
that people speak the word death and acknowledge the death that comes along with this disease. Um, I mean, we're not all, you know, asymptomatic muscle boys and kickboxing uh, dykes, you know, fighting this epidemic. It's, there is, you know, there, there's a tendency uh, in the face of media images of AIDS, you know, that we've been fed over the years. Um, there's a, there's a tendency to uh, try to fight those images so that there were created statements like people living with AIDS, people fighting with AIDS, you know, uh, which I, I find nothing wrong with and I, I agree with trying to dismantle those media images. But then I think at times in the activist community that there's a tendency to go into total denial about death, which a society has always done anyways. I mean, I always felt as a teenager and growing up that if this society even could for five minutes deal with mortality on a on a coast-to-coast a -coast level I mean in education and you know our institutions and our schools that most of us would never be doing the things that we're doing that we would wouldn't care to live in and support the social structure if we really understood something about our mortality and to leave the, the bed of a friend who can't even put a spoon in his own mouth and then go to some public gathering where somebody makes a statement that AIDS is not about death uh, is outrageous to me. It's, it's no less outrageous than what common media will do. It's, uh, I guess the, the problem is, is to find a way of, of expressing the effects of this epidemic that gather in all aspects of it, not just not just singling out certain aspects like people living with AIDS. You know, it's people living with AIDS and people dying of AIDS. And that's the whole point of fighting this epidemic and trying to educate public. Um, I think, it, you know, it brings up other issues too, uh, you know, that, uh, I mean, that I've experienced over the last uh, seven, eight years of buzzwords like courage and strength that he or she was so courageous as they came to their death or he or she had so much strength and uh, they're just buzzwords for politeness and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to crawl into the, the media grave of AIDS and just die courageously or politely. Uh, you know, I have no desire to be polite in the face of a slow, you know, being slowly murdered. Well, I know that, uh, that I'm not, you know, if I die, I'm not going to die simply because I got fucked in the ass without a condom or swallowed some stranger's cum. Um, I know that I'm going to die because of the way this, this disease has been handled by those in positions of power. And I would say that they're the owners of newspapers, the owners of TV stations, owners of radio of uh, all members of organized religion that have failed to address this epidemic because they prefer to maintain that uh, this disease has a, a moral code and a sexual orientation and that, that to them is uh, makes these people who are dying of this disease or affected by this disease expendable and also politicians uh, the formation of a soundbite culture in terms of information. Um, it's really those in positions of power in this country that are responsible for the way this uh, disease is spreading and, and killing. There seems to be this sort of aversion to uh, anger. And it's not just, I mean, just in society in general, it's there's a uh, anger gets the same treatment as mortality, which is people just go into denial about it or somehow anger as an emotion uh, is yet another taboo in this country that we should suppress our anger or we shouldn't speak angrily or we shouldn't. It's the same thing as you know, the courage or strength uh, being buzzwords for polite, that one should act polite in the face of being slowly murdered. Um, anger is a is an emotion that I I think is extremely valuable. Uh, it's a it's a transitory emotion. 
it's something that leads you out of one place into another, whether it's out of inactivity into activity. Um, and it, it somehow catalyzes a, a, a series of reactions to events that one experiences or one contains or one carries. Um, I've had people try to explain away some of the things that I've said or done by saying, oh, he's angry because he has AIDS. And I don't think you need to be carrying this virus to, to have a reaction to how this epidemic has been handled. Um, I think everybody has a right to be angry. And I, I feel like I've come to a place in my life that if people prefer to see me as a monster at times because of what they witness of my anger, then I, I prefer to be seen as a monster. It's, it's actually comforting because it just gives me more room and, uh, and allows me more room to express the range of things that I feel. If I come to a place where I feel hate or if I come to a place where I feel outrage or where I feel rage itself and that starts translating itself into activities, I think that's perfectly good for myself. Uh, it's where I am, it's what I see and perceive and respond to and how I respond. It's, uh, you know, rage is a really interesting tool to dismantle this whole illusion of things like one tribe nation or general public or uh, what's acceptable or not acceptable. I mean, the, the things that I loved in experiences of activism, um, we're not so much the media revolutionaries or the photogenic revolutionaries or activists who, you know, most get attention or press or airtime on, you know, some spot on the TV news. It's the people that are most enthralled by or the who I I feel the most responsive to is like the lesbian waitress from New Jersey who with her frightened girlfriend are for the first time laying their body on the line where they're, they're choosing to get arrested. And what I love about them and what I'm really impressed with about those people, people like that, the ones who are uh, not really celebrated by media or you know, photogenic enough for media is that they actually are approaching a, a wall of illusions called law and they're dismantling that wall for the first time in their lives by realizing that they don't have to uh, participate in that illusion of law in terms of what's right or what's wrong. Um, and that they're actually beginning to dismantle that wall of illusion. And when you, once you cross that line, you realize like these religious institutions, these uh, public uh, buildings, these public institutions, the institutions of government, you realize they're just made of stone or a series of stones placed together. You realize that these people, especially those uh, responsible for this epidemic, those who are, you know, most, uh, uh, who most affect the course of this epidemic because of their bigotry posing as virtue, you realize that they're just made of blood and muscle and bones. And that those, those buildings and those people can be dismantled just as easily as anything else uh, once you break through that wall of illusion called law. I have no traditional moral reaction to the idea of murder um, in terms of what I was fed growing up in the society. I mean, I, I don't see the slow murder of myself and the people I love as being any more acceptable. Um, or less acceptable than the murder of others in order to either protect ourselves or to take revenge. And the, the only thing that ever occurs to me in those thoughts of murder is wondering if the planet will spin a little bit faster once these people are gone. <laughs>